through the word. And so we encourage you to take a look at the bulletin and you'll discover the many opportunities that the Lord has given to us to grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Every night of the week, something going on here at Calvary Chapel. And so we encourage you to get involved. Especially if you're new to Calvary Chapel, it's sort of hard to develop relationships in such a large congregation in the Sunday services. It's great to get together in the smaller groups, either in the home Bible study fellowships or in some of the many group fellowships that we have here at the church during the week for uh, special groups, the uh, opportunities of getting uh, in a close fellowship are much better in the smaller groupings. That is, um, of course, with the ladies' fellowship, you get the opportunity on the Friday mornings not only to have the larger fellowship together, but the small group studies. And it works out extremely well. And if you ladies haven't signed up for this fall's Joyful Life study, we encourage you to do it as quickly as possible so that they can get you assigned to the various groups that will be established when the study begins again. And uh, so it gives you a head start uh, when the studies actually begin at the end of September. So you ladies planning to be a part of the Joyful Life studies this fall, make sure that you get signed up there in the office. God has been doing awesome things this summer. Uh, I think it's been one of the greatest summers of my life as we've had the opportunity of ministering to so many hundreds of young people there at the conference center, an average of about 300 a week, and just to see the Spirit of God transforming lives, challenging the young people, and to just watch God's Spirit working among them has been just such a rewarding, enriching experience. How I thank God for that youth camp. How I thank God for uh, the years that it will be there to minister to young people, which are the future of the church. And uh, it's just, uh, well, you need to see it. It's one glorious facility. And uh, it's just been a total blessing. Everything that we were hoping it would be and more. It's just been Glory. So, well, you know, adjectives fail you. It's just God, when he works, you know, how can you describe it? It's just beautiful. Let's turn now to Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, as we continue our journey through the Bible. And now in the New Testament, Mark, chapter 8. In those days, the multitude being very great. You know, people are always interested in numbers. And it seems like we're always counting heads. Because we want to uh, say, well, we had so many attend, and we had so many come forward, and we baptized so many. There are churches even that have boards on the front in which they have number in church today, number last Sunday, number a year ago, and they post all of these statistics, and we seem to be interested in statistics. But I love it in the Bible where it just says multitudes. <laughs> Multitude being very great. And having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him, and he said unto them, I have compassion on the multitude, 
because they have now been with me for three days and have had nothing to eat. There was such an intense interest in the teaching of Jesus, in the work of Jesus in their midst, that they had been in this deserted area, and, and we read he went across to a, a desert place. Read that deserted place. Because around the Sea of Galilee, there really isn't a desert place. It is beautiful. It is lush. It is uh, very pretty. And so uh, there are deserted areas even to the present time. And the area that Jesus went is quite deserted. Um, oh, except for a water park that they put in a few years ago. But that's not sort of in keeping with the New Testament. You somehow... Don't associate the Sea of Galilee with water slides and all. And uh, about the area where he fed the 5,000 and so forth, they do have a water park now. But uh, at that, that time was quite deserted. And uh, so they had been there, he said, with him for three days and had not eaten. They probably just slept there at night. And in the morning, Jesus, with the morning light, would begin teaching again. He would begin working in their midst once more. And so intense was the interest that they were there for three days. Great multitude of people. We, are, we read there were 4,000 men beside the women and children. Uh, Mark doesn't tell us that. He just said 4,000. But Matthew adds, beside the women and children. And so Jesus said, I have compassion. Why? Because they've been with me for these three days and have had nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own homes, they will faint in the way because many of them have come from long distances. And so Jesus concerned, they're going to go home now, but he's concerned for their welfare. They're, he's concerned for their uh, not fainting, knowing their weakness. He's moved with compassion to minister to them physical things. Now, there is always that spiritual ministry of Jesus, which is glorious, and that had been going on for three days. But we are still in these bodies, and we still are subject to uh, the weaknesses and the frailties of the human body. And the Lord is aware of that. He's conscious of that. He knows we're made of dust. And he is conscious of our human weaknesses. But to me, it is comforting to know that as he is conscious of our human weaknesses, he has compassion on us because of our human weaknesses. He understands when you're tired. He understands when you're not up to a task. He understands when you're going through some real physical problems, physical afflictions. He understands. Not only does he understand, he's compassionate. He has pity and compassion. And his disciples answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? How in the world can we feed them? How can we satisfy them with bread in this deserted area? I guess they didn't remember much of their history how that their fathers were for 40 years in the wilderness and how God provided them bread from heaven. And we remember in Psalm 78, as the psalmist records these events in the wilderness, even after God had been providing the manna, the people finally said, we're tired of this manna. Can God provide a table in the wilderness? Can he give us meat? And they lusted after meat, and God showed that he could provide them meat in the wilderness. Here, they were wondering, how can we provide bread here in the wilderness? And he asked them, 
How many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. And so he commanded the people to sit down on the ground and he took the seven loaves and he gave thanks and he broke them. And he gave to his disciples to set before them and they did set them before the people and they had a few small fish and he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. So they did eat and again this word filled, glutted. They ate and were stuffed. And they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets. Seven loaves, they end up with seven baskets of broken fragments left over. And they that had eaten were about 4,000 men and Matthew adds plus the women and children and he sent them away. And immediately he entered into a ship with his disciples, and they came into the parts of Dalmanutha. Now, Dalmanutha is a section. It's sort of, you might say, the county of Dalmanutha. And this is, again, back over on the other side, on the uh, west side of the Sea of Galilee. He had been on the east side, northeast side, uh, when he fed the 5,000 and back almost in the same area where he fed the 5,000, he is now feeding the 4,000. Which brings up an interesting point and that is that somehow this miracle just did not sink in with the disciples. When he fed the 5,000, uh, somehow it, it didn't really impress them uh, it, it, somehow their eyes were blinded to the miraculous aspect of it. Uh, and uh, we read in, in verse 52 of chapter 6, after the feeding of the 5,000, uh, it said, For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Now, he's talking about the disciples. And they... they uh, were, of course, worried when they were out there in the sea thinking that uh, uh, they were never going to make it and Jesus came walking to them on the water and he came up into the ship, the wind ceased, they were amazed, wondered beyond measure and with wonderment because they didn't consider, they, they somehow still didn't fully realize that Jesus was master over the universe, over elements, able to multiply the bread, able to multiply the fish, able to walk on the water, able to still the storms. Somehow it just didn't sink in because their hearts were hardened. I pray that God will ever keep our hearts open, sensitive to the working of the Spirit, that we will always be amazed and look in wonderment at the creation of God and at his power and that we won't take things for granted but just constantly being reminded and refreshed by the grace of God and by the love of God and by the work of God in our midst. You know, God has been blessing here for so many years. And what's happening here on any given Sunday would be just such an amazement to, to people from all over the world who have been sitting in dead churches for so long and have not seen the work of God or the hand of God. And the fact that it has been going on for so long, sometimes I'm afraid we're prone to just sort of take it for granted rather than being just in awe and in amazement of what God is doing. Just constantly thrilled, constantly blessed because of the goodness and the blessings of God that we see. So, they entered the ship, they came over to Dalmanutha, 
which is back on the west side, and it's slightly south of Capernaum. Uh, there is this little village of Magdala on the Sea of Galilee. It doesn't exist anymore. There's just a little church there that is mistakenly called the Church of the Loaves and the Fish. Whoever built that church had not read the scripture carefully and realized that uh, the uh, miracle took place on the other side of the lake. And uh, it was after the miracle they came across the lake to Dalmanutha. But in the older days, it was more difficult for the uh, pilgrims to, who went to uh, Israel to get around to the other. They didn't have roads around to the other side of the lake, and so they just built the church over on a more convenient spot uh, so they could take the pilgrims and say, this is you know, the church of the loaves and fishes. See the mosaic here on the floor? This is where Jesus fed the uh, 4,000, you know. And the poor pilgrims didn't read their Bibles enough to know that it was over on the other side of the lake either. But uh, such is the case for tourists. Uh, they, uh, <laughs> they have a lot of such sites in Israel uh, that uh, they have established as this is the spot where. Uh, and uh, it's interesting. Uh, so... Magdala, of course, is uh, the uh, little village from which Mary, the M Mary Magdalene, and Magdalene means of Magdala. And so uh, Mary Magdalene had come from this place. And so they came across to the area of Dalmanutha. It is Matthew that tells us specifically they had come to Magdala. And uh, now they're in the, they have been over in the more deserted part, or, and, and actually on the opposite side of the lake was where you had the Decapolis, the ten cities uh, that sort of developed the reputation of uh, the Galilee of the Gentiles. Now they're coming back over to uh, more of the Jewish side of the lake, uh, Magdala, Capernaum, and uh, here the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven and tempting him. I wonder what Jesus must have felt. The dead had been brought back to life. Lame people were walking, blind people were seeing. The multitudes had been fed with just five loaves and two fish and then seven loaves and a few fish. And yet they're saying, show us a sign. And Jesus just told them, as he sighed deeply in his spirit. I mean, it just, it was probably, oh, come on, give me a break. Can't you see what's been happening? He sighed deeply in his spirit. And he said, why does this generation seek after a sign? Sort of common, though, is that people today are still looking for signs. Somehow they're blind to what God is doing and what God has done. Now, Matthew tells us that Jesus, at this point, said to them, in the evening, if the sky is red, you say, tomorrow we're going to have a fair day. But if in the morning the sky is red, then you say, oh, it's going to be bad weather today. We're going to have a wind come up. He said, you hypocrites. You know how to read the signs of the heavens. They're looking for a sign from heaven. And he said, you know how to read the signs from heaven, but you don't know the sign of the coming. So he said, there's no sign going to be given to you. Matthew tells us, he said, accept the sign of the prophet Jonah. 
For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days. In other words, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead will be the great and final sign that he indeed was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God, that he came and was sent by God to bear our sins. His resurrection from the dead was to be the proof of all that he had declared. This was to seal the statements that he had made, to give the final proof that he indeed was the Son of God. That's why Satan seeks to fight uh, the truth of the resurrection from the dead, throwing doubts and questions concerning his resurrection. And he left them. I mean, he didn't spend much time there, headed back over to the other side of the sea again. So he's, he's, he's crossing quite a bit now. Uh, he was over there on the eastern, northeastern side, feeding the multitudes, came over to the western side, challenged by the Pharisees, and all asking him for a sign. So then he gets in the ship and heads back over to the area now of Bethsaida, which is slightly north of where he was. In fact, Bethsaida was on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And at that point, the northern shore isn't that wide. It, the Sea of Galilee runs from north to south, and the long shores are along the north to south. But the northern shore itself and the southern shore are not that wide. And Bethsaida was right there on the northern shore. So he came over again to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. And neither had they in the ship with them any more than just one loaf. They'd slipped up. They forgot to take bread with them only one loaf there in the ship. And so Jesus just in talking to them said, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Now they didn't understand what he's, what does he mean by that? The leaven of, the, what's he talking about? Ones that I know. Oh, we forgot to take bread. <laughs> and, he's, and he's sort of rebuking us, you know, because we... <sighs> and they thought they understood what he was saying. But they didn't, they didn't understand at all what he was saying. I think that this is oftentimes true. People think they understand the Bible. They understand what the Bible is saying, but really they don't have the slightest idea of what the Bible says. You hear people talking authoritatively of the apple that Eve ate in the Garden of Eden, you know. We had a debate here one time. We had couple of college professors from Cal State Fullerton who were de debating with Dr. Gish and um, Dr. Henry Morris. And uh, this one professor from Fullerton, a colorful man, uh, who was, of course, debating the evolutionary side, uh, talked about how people just... Uh, don't understand the Bible when they read it, you know. And he said, for instance, most people believe that Eve ate an apple. He said, it wasn't an apple, it was a pomegranate. <laughs> I don't know where he got pomegranate. <laughs> but we didn't believe that she ate an apple either. I mean, but uh, just, you know, he was talking about ignorant people who were thinking it was an apple and then declaring it was a pomegranate when uh, I don't know what Bible he was reading. <laughs> but uh, that's unfortunately what, the way it is. So many times people speak 
so authoritatively concerning what the Bible says. And uh, it's not what the Bible says at all. And so uh, here they, they thought, oh, yeah, we know what he means. <laughs> we forgot to bring bread. And so as they were trying to figure this out among themselves, and finally the one, you know, and they sort of go, oh, yes, that, oh, my, yes, of course, you know. And when Jesus knew it, he said unto them, why do you reason because you have no bread? Why is that, you know, your reason? You come up with, a, with the answer that you have. Why do you reason that that is what it is? Don't you perceive even yet? Don't you understand? Have you your hearts still hardened? Now remember after the 5,000 feeding, uh, they didn't really grasp it. Their hearts were, are your hearts still hardened? Now you've seen twice my capacity to take little and make much. And so he reminds them. He said, having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? Do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves among the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said 12. Well, doesn't that say something to you? You know, don't you catch on? How five loaves became 12 baskets? And he, when the seven among the 4,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said, seven. And he said, then how is it that you don't understand? <laughs> Later he said to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, oh, foolish and slow of heart to believe. And I wonder how many times the Lord must get frustrated with us because of our misunderstanding. Especially our misunderstanding of his grace. How that we so often are trying to earn or deserve his favor or earn his blessings rather than just receiving his wonderful grace. Don't you understand? Paul said, oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should so soon turn from the truth? Did you receive the Spirit by the hearing of faith or by the works of the law? Don't you know that it's just faith in God that honors God and that brings the responses from God? It isn't your worthing. It isn't your working. It isn't God responding to you. But the necessity of you responding to his grace and to his goodness. Now, he's dealing with blindness. The blindness of the Pharisees. Here he had been working so many miracles, doing so many things, and they say, show us a sign. Well, they're blind if they can't see the signs. The sign that he is the Messiah. When the disciples of John the Baptist came, sent by John, who was in prison, saying, are you the one we're looking for, or shall we look for someone else? John was more or less saying, let's get the show on the road. Because even John didn't understand that he had come to give his life as a ransom for all. Are you the one we're looking for? Shall we look for someone else? And Jesus, just in that same hour, healed many of the sick who had come to him, was doing miracles was sharing God's love and God's truth with the people. And he said, go back and tell John what you have seen. 
The lame are walking, the blind are receiving their sight, and unto the poor the gospel is being preached. Now those were signs of the Messiah. It says the lame will leap for joy, the blind will see, and the mute will be praising God. And to the humble, the gospel will be preached. And so here they are, the signs of the Messiah. And John recognized when the disciples of John came back and said, wow, we saw people who were blind and, and they were able to see. We saw people who were lame, able to walk. And, and he was teaching the people of God's wonderful love. And, and that's, that was the sign. John recognized, yes, those are the signs of the Messiah. But the Pharisees are blind to these things. Show us a sign. Give us a sign. And now even the disciples are blind. They're blind to his, what he is doing. He, he's fed the 5,000 beside the women and children with the five loaves and two fish. They took up 12 baskets. Now, what then did he mean? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. In another place, he said, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Leaven was the rising agent in the dough. Leaven causes... A, a rotting, actually, and it, as the dough rots, it, it, the little bubbles oxygen form, and it causes the dough to rise. But all you need is just a little starter, the sourdough starter, you know. You just put a little bit in, and it will permeate through the whole pan of, of dough. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, Paul told the Corinthians and also the Galatians. He told the Corinthians in the uh, context of how they were tolerating an evil man in their fellowship. And he said, don't you realize that this toleration of evil, a little leaven will leaven the whole lump? In the feast of the Passover... It was very important that the bread that they made had no leaven in it. It was definitely pres prescribed by the Lord that there shouldn't be any leaven. And thus, during the Feast of the Passover, there's the search through the house to get rid of all of the leaven, that they might observe the Passover without any leavening. And thus, leaven has become in the Scriptures a type of sin, how that you tolerate or allow a little sin and how it begins to permeate your whole life. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Now hypocrisy, the leaven of the Pharisees, it was the outward religion. Everything was done for outward show. They were interested in impressing men of their spirituality and of their righteousness, and it was all outward, but inward, they didn't have it. Inward, there was malice, there was strife, there was jealousy, there was all of these evil things within. As Jesus said, you're like whitewashed sepulchers. On the outside, you've been whitewashed, and you're painted, and you look you know, attractive, but inside you're full of dead man's bones. You clean the outside of the platter, but within there's all kinds of filth. And so be careful of that kind of religion that is just outwardly manifested and displayed, but isn't something that is going on in your heart. It's interesting how that religion seems to always seek to work from the outside in, where Christianity works from the inside out. God begins the work in your heart and it becomes manifested outwardly. But the religions are all outward prescriptions of, you know, thou shalt and thou shalt not. And it, and it becomes a, a thing where you put on and... and 
living under the law, they had put on this uh, appearance of righteousness. But it was hypocrisy. It was just an act. Hupokrites, that's the Hebrew, I mean the Greek word for actor. And they were just acting. But it wasn't a reality in their hearts. Be careful of that, Jesus said. So they came to Bethsaida, back to the north side, the northernmost side, really, of the Sea of Galilee. And they brought a blind man unto him. And they begged him to just touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. Interesting. Here he is in Bethsaida, and they brought this blind man, and Jesus takes him and leads him. And can you see the picture of a Jesus leading this blind man? Again, the tenderness, the compassion, the willingness to just minister to one people when the crowds, the multitudes are seeking him, and yet taking time. For this one blind man. And taking him by the hand, he led him out of the town, and when he had spit on his eyes. Now, interesting, because a few chapters earlier, we find him spitting uh, on the uh, tongue of a, of a mute uh, and, and loosing the tongue so he could speak. Now he is spitting in the eyes of this blind man. And we have one other case in Jerusalem where a blind man came to Jesus and he spit in the dirt and made a little bit of mud with his spittle and put the mud in the guy's eye and, and then said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And when he washed, he was able to see. Again, interesting how that Jesus did not pattern the healings. He worked in different ways. Not always the same. <laughs> so that we would not seek to limit him to one particular method or one particular way. We are so anxious to create formulas. And, and we're so anxious to get things, you know, in line. So if you do this, this, and this, you know, A plus B equals C. And, and the Lord would not be confined to formulas. But that's all that we need to create a new denomination. The denomination of he spit in my eye. <laughs> and the denomination of he made mud in my eye. You know, I mean, uh, because this is the way he did it to me. And... You know, if he didn't do it to you the way he did it to me, then, you know, you, he really didn't work in your life, you know. And, and, uh, but he, he works in diverse ways. So he took the blind man. I, I see tenderness here. Let him out of town. When he spit in his eyes, he put his hands upon him, and he asked him, can you see? Can you see anything, actually? And he looked up and he said, I see men walking as trees. In other words, he had blurred vision. He couldn't see men distinctly. It, it looked like maybe, you know, a tree was moving or something. And this is interesting to me, the fact that uh, the healing was gradual. And again, I think it is something important to realize that oftentimes the healing is gradual. It doesn't always come all at once. But many times the healing is gradual. And so he put his hands again upon his eyes and he said, now look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell it to anyone in the town. Go, don't go back into Bethsaida until just go home. 
So then Jesus went with his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. Now, from Bethsaida to Caesarea Philippi is a distance of probably 50, 55 miles. So they are journeying now in the area that is called the Upper Galilee region, uh, going up to Caesarea Philippi, which is right at the base of Mount Hermon. Caesarea Philippi is where you have two of the major sources of the Jordan River. Right at Caesarea Philippi is the great spring of Banyas, and nearby in the city of Dan was the spring of Dan, and thus uh, the two of the three major sources of the Jordan River. Coming right out of the rock at the base of, of Mount Hermon, uh, there at Banyas, Caesarea Philippi. So he's all the way up now in the northern border of Israel. And uh, he is coming into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? What are people saying about me? Who do they think I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. That was Herod's evaluation. He said, John has come back to life. And some of them say, Elijah. Now, it was prophesied that Elijah would come before the Lord, prepare the hearts of the people and all. Others said, one of the prophets. That is, uh, <laughs> that's what the Muhammad, say, Muhammad said, that he was one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said unto him, You are the Messiah. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them, now that you recognize that I am the Messiah, there's something that you need to know, and he's going to deal with another area of blindness. Now, interesting, the blindness of the Pharisees, the blindness of the disciples, their hearts were hardened, they didn't recognize the miracles of the multiplication of the loaves and fish. The blind man of Bethsaida, that was a physical blindness. Now he's dealing with the spiritual blindness again. You're the Messiah. Right but you're blind to the purpose of the Messiah. You think that I am going to establish God's kingdom now. You think that you're going to have these great positions now in the kingdom, that we're going to overthrow Rome and we're going to establish now the kingdom of God. But you're wrong. You're blind. There were many prophecies of the Old Testament that had to be fulfilled. He had to be despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He had to be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. According to Daniel, he had to be cut off. According to Isaiah, cut off from the land of the living. According to the Psalms, he had to be placed on a cross. So, He's now beginning to try and open their eyes to what would actually be taking place to the Messiah. And so he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priest. The stone which was rejected by the builders He's got to be rejected by the builders, the chief priests, the elders. And he must be killed as a lamb led to the slaughter, so he opened not his mouth. Take him from the land of the living, and who shall declare his generation? 
He must be killed and after three days rise again. Now somehow they were so shocked by this change of their opinion of the Messiah and the reigning of the Messiah that when he talks about I'm going to be killed their minds at that point just shut off and they don't hear the rest. They don't hear after three days he's going to rise again. You know, it's possible that uh, you can say things that are so shocking that while people are sort of absorbing or letting it sink in what has shocked them, they go, you know, and, and they don't hear the rest of what you say. I decided one Easter Sunday many years ago to open my Easter Sunday message with a shocking statement just to sort of get people's attention. And, and I said, Jesus Christ really did not rise from the dead. There is no resurrection. And then I said, how does that make you feel? Now, there are many people who are saying that today. And, you know, but if there is no, and then I went on to preach, if Christ be not risen, you know, then our hope is vain, all this kind of stuff. But there was a couple that met me at the door and were yelling at me after church. That's the <laughs> most horrible thing we've ever heard, to tell people he didn't rise from the dead. Didn't you hear my whole sermon? I mean, that was just the opening statement. And I said, how does that make you feel? But that's what some people are saying today. And then I went on to preach, but now is Christ risen? They didn't hear the rest of the sermon, though. I mean, that just so shocked them. Their minds turned off at that point. And, and this is what happened to the disciples when Jesus said, and I'm going to be killed. Who oh, you know. And, and they didn't hear, but after three days, I'm going to rise again. That, that just went right over them. And so Peter took upon himself. And he began to rebuke him. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> rebuking the Lord. Peter, I mean, he. But when he had turned about, that is, Jesus turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter. And he said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. In other words, you don't really have spiritual discernment. Now, when Jesus said, where, when Peter said, Thou art the Messiah, the Son of the living God, Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. God's given you a revelation. Now when Jesus said, And the Son of Man, one of the titles as we've told you for the Messiah, is going to be killed, then Peter begins to rebuke him and say, Lord, be that far from thee. Perish the thought. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, he couldn't tell what was a revelation from the Spirit of God and what was a revelation from Satan. He lacked spiritual discernment. On one hand, you can have a revelation from God. Another hand, time, you're, you're, you're speaking Satan's jargon. That all changed when Peter was filled with the Spirit. And in the book of Acts, we find Peter with very keen spiritual discernment. The case of Ananias and Sapphira, the case of uh, Simon of uh, the sorcerer from uh, uh, Samaria. But at this stage, lacking spiritual discernment, could not tell what was from God, what was from man. And so when he called the people unto him, with his disciples, he said unto them, 
Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You have to deny the self-life. The Bible teaches against the self-life, the self-centered life, the selfish life. To follow Jesus, you've got to give up the self-life even as he gave up the self-life. Let this mind be in you which also was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God and thought it not something to be grasped, to be equal with God, yet he emptied himself. And he came in the form and likeness of man as a servant, obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So the self-life, that's got to go if you're going to follow Jesus. It's, it's not in keeping with Jesus who emptied himself. And so we must empty ourselves from whatever we thought we were and be willing to take the position of a servant to serve others, to help others, to minister to others, not thinking of ourselves, but concern and thinking of others. Deny himself. Denying the self-life and anything that would separate me from completely following Jesus. Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. There are some things that can hinder my progress in my walk with the Lord. They're not wrong. They're not, you know, you can't label them sin and all, but they just are hindrances. In Hebrews, it speaks about laying aside every weight and sin which doth so easily beset us. They become impediments, hindering our process of following Jesus. And so the denying of those things that would hinder me stand in the way. Secondly, take up his cross. Now, when Jesus was facing the cross, and was praying that if it were possible, the cup would pass. He added, nevertheless, not what my will, but thy will be done. And so when he says, take up the cross, he's talking about a full surrender of your will to the will of God. The laying down of your will that you might do the will of the Father. Whatever that may be, whatever that may entail laying down your ambitions to do his will. And then the third is to follow me, and that is he set the example, having uh, set the example for us, as Peter says, in suffering, that we should follow in his steps. And so following him, the example of self-sacrifice, the example of compassion, the example of love, the example of caring for others. That's the way Jesus would have you to live. Giving, and more interested in giving than receiving. Loving, forgiving, tender. These are the characteristics that the Lord would have you to have. They are the characteristics that mark the life of Jesus. And we need to remember this. It's so easy for us to get set in our own little rigid, stubborn kind of ways, and this is the way I want to see it done, and they don't do it the way I like to have it done. And, you know, and, and that is so unchristlike. But yet we feel so super spiritual because we can judge them the way they are, you know, and, and, and it's so unlike Jesus. 
we get disgusted with people, what's wrong with them, and, and Jesus looks and has compassion on them. We get so uptight and I'll never forgive him for look what he did to me, you know. And look what they did to Jesus, but he prayed, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Oh, we've got such a long way to go. It's sort of discouraging in a way. I've been, you know, so many years seeking to follow the Lord. And yet, when I look at my life and next to the life of Jesus, I realize that so far to go. Oh, God, ever keep me conscious of my need to be more Christ-like in every action and in every reaction to others following him. And then he gives what I call the divine rationale, and I can't argue with it. It is so logical and so reasonable that uh, there is no argument. For whosoever will save his life will lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same will save it. You live for yourself. You try to hang on for yourself. You live a selfish life, and you're going to lose the real meaning for life. But you just lose your life in Christ, and you really discover life. This is life. This is it. That life that is just surrendered and committed to Jesus. You, you, there's, just, there's just, you know, this is it. This is the life. And what should it profit a man? If he would gain the whole world, but in so doing, lose his own soul. We were sharing with the kids up at camp that one of our problems is that we lose sight and of the eternal. We are here on this earth, but, for, uh, but such a short time. In fact, I was, I was thinking the other day, just how, sh how short has been the time that man has been on the earth. You know, you're looking at 6,000 years of human history from the time of Adam till now. That's not very long. In fact, if you live to be 100, you'll actually live one-sixtieth of the time of human history. Interesting. But eternity. And, and even if I would live to be one-sixtieth of the whole human history, that's such a short, short time when you compare it with eternity. And what if in that short span of time I gained the wealth of the world? I was reading today in the paper about this one fellow in Mexico that in the last few years has amassed $6.6 .6 billion. He's three times richer than Ross Perot because of the way corruption works in Mexico. What will that profit him if in the gaining of that through corrupt practices he loses his soul? And then secondly, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What would you trade your soul for? How much does Satan have to offer you? that you would sell your soul. <laughs> Esau hated his birthright or despised it, didn't care about it. He, he sold it for a mess of pottage, some lentil soup. And there are people today who are selling their soul for a mess of pottage 
junk for the baubles that Satan has. You know, we, we read uh, with, sh with shame and disgrace how that those early Europeans who came to America defrauded the Indians with the sparkling glass beads and traded them beads for gold. And, and we are embarrassed and ashamed at that part of the history, how men would take advantage of other men, trading precious gold for shiny beads. And yet I think of how many people today are trading their souls for the shiny baubles that Satan offers. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And then Jesus declared, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Oh, sounds like he's talking about today. Adulterous and sinful generation. Whoever will be ashamed of me and my words. Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Heavy. There's a lot of pressure against Christianity today. More and more, the popular game of the liberals is Christian bashing. Now, it's very politically incorrect to bash the homosexual and her homosexual lifestyle. You can get in real trouble for that. But they're taking real sport now in bashing Christians. Sort of reminds you of the scripture of, Woe unto them who call evil good and who call good evil. And woe unto a nation who is ruled by people who call evil good and who call good evil. We're living in days when it's going to cost us something to stand up for Jesus Christ and the word of Jesus Christ. To stand up for righteousness, to stand up for truth, to stand up for purity and morality. What does it take to get you in jail today? You thought about that? Taking a knife and removing an important part of your husband's anatomy? Will that get you in jail? No. Killing someone? Not if you have sharp enough attorneys. Going into a church, screaming, yelling, obscenities, breaking up a service? Nope. What does it take to get you in jail? Oh, praying in front of an abortion clinic. That'll get you in jail. What crazy days we're living in. The pressures. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me and my words in this sinful and adulterous generation, then I'll be ashamed of you when I come in the glory of the Father with my holy angels. Chances are you're going to have to stand up for Christ. Chances are persecution is going to increase against the church. Chances are the ridicule is going to increase. Do you have enough of God's grace and spirit within you to stand up against it? 
when the real testing comes? You see, it's very easy for us to be here tonight. We're in sort of a specialized group and we have similar interest and concerns in the Lord and the things of the Word, but when the real pressure comes, will you be able to stand? Do you have enough of Christ? Deep enough convictions to follow him to the cross. May God help us. Father, we thank you tonight again for your word and for the strength and the help that it gives to us. Lord, our hearts are deeply concerned with the things that are happening in the world around us with the direction that we see things going. Oh, Lord, come quickly, we pray. Jesus, we long to see you and more to see your kingdom come and your will be done here in this earth even as it is being done in heaven. Lord, once again, we cry by reason of the taskmasters because of the heavy bondage that is being placed upon those who are seeking to live for you. Come, Lord, free us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we stand. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for Now, on behalf of The Word for Today, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Chuck Smith, we thank you for joining us in today's broadcast. For more of Pastor Chuck's studies and biblical teaching resources, visit our website at pastorchuck.org. You can contact The Word for Today at The Word for Today, P.O. Box 890-820, Temecula, California, 92589 or email us at infopastorchuck at gmail.com. We'll return with more of our verse-by-verse Bible study in our next broadcast with Pastor Chuck.